When you say the word zombie, people often conjure up images of hordes of the undead walking the earth and feasting on the living. This image has been greatly influenced by popular culture's take on the phenomena, which has even built on to include diseases and science creating their own zombie hordes. But just how did this perception of zombies come about, and is there any truth in it? Arguments continue over the origins of the zombie phenomena, and even the word zombie itself. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, the word zombie was first recorded into English in 1819 by European explorers in West Africa. In these areas, the word was used as an equivalent to corpse or spirit in English. Many people from this region were forcefully relocated as slaves to the Caribbean, taking their religious beliefs with them, which greatly began to merge with local beliefs. But as well as relocating the Africans, the European slavers also forced them to adopt Christianity, and this led to a degree of religious confusion amongst the unfortunate slave and local populations, something that continues to this day. In Haiti, the word zombie already existed when the Africans arrived, and was the name given to a snake god, but this seemed to fall out of use, for it was during this time that the word zombie became associated with the apparent rising of the dead by Haitian witch doctors. Since the Africans saw an apparent corpse come to life, these witch doctors achieved this feat by putting people into a dead-like state using either drugs or deep hypnosis, whereby externally there was no indication of life in the body before then reviving them. Without modern medical assessment techniques, it did appear that these witch doctors had revived the dead, and the process was often so traumatic on the victim that they awoke in a trance-like state. Thus we have both aspects of the modern perception of zombies, death and then rebirth into a subhuman level of consciousness and behavior. Even the witch doctors believed in their power, and many continue to do so to this day. In fact, in 1994, when the US threatened to invade Haiti, acting president Emile Jonasint warned the US troops would face up to three battalions of zombie soldiers. It is this fascinating phenomena that popular culture has taken to heart in recent decades. Although zombies have appeared in books and movies since the beginning of the 20th century, it was George A. Romero's Night of the Living Dead, which is cited as giving birth to the modern zombie genre. Despite the fact the word zombie is never used once in the film, with the continuing success of films and television shows such as World War Z and The Walking Dead, and even the US Center for Disease Control, publishing a manual on how to survive an infestation of zombies, the public interest in the topic remains high. So, just how real is this phenomena, and could we ever one day actually face a zombie apocalypse? Let's find out. If we study the natural world for an answer, then we can see there are numerous examples of zombie-producing diseases, flora, fungi, and even insects, and some of these can have startling effects on living creatures. In the jungles of Thailand, a species of fungus called Ophia cordyceps requires a lot of sunlight to survive and reproduce, and it has developed a frightening way of getting itself to the sun. It seizes control of the brain of an ant, and forces it to climb above the cover of the vegetation on the ground so it may bask in the sunlight, grow, and then release its spores. The unfortunate zombie ant is then left to die. When you consider that the fungus doesn't even have a brain of its own, this control of another creature is all the more remarkable a feat of nature. There are, however, creatures with their own brains who deliberately seek out and take full control of other creatures to make them do their bidding as zombies. In Japan, there exists a wasp called Reclinovallus nielseni, the female of which will attack a spider and deposit her eggs into the unfortunate arachnid's abdomen. But that's not the end of it. Nobody is exactly sure why or how, but the spider's sole purpose then becomes to protect the eggs it has been infested with. In some cases, the spider has been observed abandoning their old webs and constructing a new one in order to better protect its wasp larvae while they grow. Eventually, the wasp larvae start to consume the spider before evicting its carcass from the web and making it their own, while they enter cocoons. Scientists theorize that the larvae control the spider's behavior by injecting mind-altering hormones into them. Effectively, they are being drugged. 
but zombie-inducing parasites are not just limited to the insect world. In the southwest United States, the California killfish is unfortunately in the grip of its own zombie apocalypse. Nearly the whole population is infected with parasitic worms, known as trematodes, which live in their brains, and when enough of these accumulate, they begin to deliberately affect the fish's behavior. The worms themselves require ingestion by birds to thrive, and so they seize control of the fish and make it behave in such a way that it attracts a predatory bird, which then dives down and catches the fish. As the fish is consumed, so too are the worms. The infection rate amongst the fish is so high that when in 2020, researchers at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography at the University of California, San Diego, wanted to investigate the impact they were having on the fish's behavior, they had to artificially inseminate eggs in a lab to produce uninfected fish. Their results found that the fish that were exposed to the worms, after they matured, reacted less aggressively than those exposed to them almost from birth in the wild. This implied that the species had learned to take actions against them, such as to try and rub them off their bodies before the parasite took hold, whereas the lab fish, who had no older fish to teach them this, let the parasites take hold more easily. So if the natural world is awash with zombie creatures, then can humans become zombie-like as well as insects and fish? The answer is categorically a yes. In recent years, a theory has emerged concerning Toxoplasma gondii, a parasite found in cat feces, that it can make people like and want to be around cats in order to continue its life cycle, much like how the tremidodes affect the killfish. Although the parasite can pose major problems for people with weakened immune systems, Healthy people are generally capable of fighting it off without experiencing more than mild flu-like symptoms. Once the initial symptoms are over, the protozoan was believed to go into a dormant stage in the brain, but now research has found that this may not be the case. Instead, recent studies have found that this protozoan may actually be capable of influencing the host behavior, including humans, especially if they live in close proximity to a cat. Researchers have even found evidence of toxoplasmosis, the disease caused by infection with Toxoplasma gondii in ancient Egyptian mummies, a society that actually worshipped cats, and at least 60 million people in the United States alone are estimated to be infected with some degree today through contact with cat droppings in their pet's litter trays. So while the internet may like to point fun at the idea of crazy cat people, the truth may very well be more insidious. In nature, there is one thing that is most commonly attributed to zombie-like behavior, and worryingly humans are not immune. It isn't a parasite, but rather it's a viral disease that exists on every continent on Earth except Antarctica. Rabies. Rabies is usually associated with the infection of dogs since 95% of human rabies is the result of a bite from an infected canine. But the truth is that it can be transmitted to and from numerous domestic and wild animals, or even people, the disease is passed via the saliva in the infected creature's mouth, and if left untreated before the incubation period is complete, it is fatal in almost every case. As the disease takes hold, the infected person begins to exhibit irrational and often violent behavior, which is why it's associated with zombies. According to the World Health Organization, 70% of rabies cases involve people with what is known as the furious version of the virus. In these instances, people exhibit signs of hyperactivity or excitable behavior, causing them to act irrationally, and it is at this point they are most dangerous to others, since they could become violent and injure people who then may become infected themselves. At the same time, they will also develop a severe case of hydrophobia, a fear of water, since the virus affects the brain's ability to instruct the throat to swallow. This becomes such a concern for the sufferer of rabies that even the thought of swallowing water is terrifying, despite the fact he or she may be extremely dehydrated. In some rare cases, the sufferer also has a growing aversion to drafts or gusts of air. At this late stage, death usually occurs after just a few days due to cardiorespiratory arrest. But it's not just physical illness that can create zombies in humans. The human brain is a miraculous achievement in itself, being capable of extremely complex emotions and problem solving in order to compensate for a human's lack of physical prowess compared to the predators that exist in nature. 
Unfortunately, that complexity leaves it vulnerable to disruption, resulting in mental illness. One rare mental illness, dubbed Cotard syndrome, has become known as walking corpse syndrome, since it involves people who believe they either lack key organs or are in fact dead, despite the fact they are walking around as normal. Essentially the popular definition of what a zombie is. The illness was first identified in France in 1880 by neurologist Jules Cotard, who was treating a woman who believed she had no innards and as a result didn't need to consume food. Despite his efforts, the unfortunate woman actually starved herself to death. Perhaps the most startling case associated with this syndrome was that of a British man known only as Graham. Graham suffered from extreme depression and decided to end his own life by taking an electrical appliance in the bath with him. The suicide attempt failed, but a few months later, Graham told doctors he was convinced his brain was either dead or missing, and that consequently he too was dead. As a result, his behaviour became increasingly irrational since he felt everything in his life was now pointless. He stopped eating or drinking, requiring medical intervention to keep him alive. He also stopped caring about things that were previously important to him, such as his car, and was often found by friends and relatives in graveyards, because in his words, it was the closest he could come to death. With the condition afflicting less than 0.75% of the population, Neurologists were quick to study Graham, and he became the first sufferer to undergo a brain scan. The results were just as startling as Graham's behaviour. Doctors found that activity levels in the large areas of his frontal and parietal brain that controls motor function, memory and sensory information were extremely low, being similar to someone in a vegetative state. Neurologist Stephen Laurie at the University of Liege in Belgium said, I've been analysing PET scans for 15 years and I've never seen anyone who was on his feet, who was interacting with people with such an abnormal scan result. Graham's brain function resembles that of someone during anaesthesia or sleep. Seeing this pattern in someone who is awake is quite unique to my knowledge. As the condition has become better understood in recent years, treating options are now available to doctors to encourage patients with this rare condition including a mixture of psychological methods and certain medication, such as antipsychotics and anti-anxiety medication. In some cases, electroconvulsive therapy is employed that sends small electrical currents to the brain, changing its chemistry configuration. This is a last resort, however, as this therapy can cause additional brain damage, resulting in memory loss and confusion. Zombie-like behavior can also be intentionally or unintentionally programmed into the brain, Behavioural psychology suggests that we learn through being conditioned to act a certain way. Behaviourism was theorised by Dr John Watson, who boasted that if he was given a dozen healthy infants, he could over time condition them to grow up to be anything, regardless of their genetic or personality traits. Doctors, lawyers or artists. So why not zombies? There are of course more immediate ways of affecting someone's behaviour in such a way that they become like zombies. Chemicals such as alcohol, antidepressants, and psychotropic drugs being introduced into the body alter or inhibit the way the brain functions, leading to changes in behaviour. We are all familiar with stories of groups of people who are intoxicated with alcohol or drugs going on a rampage because the substances they have used have temporarily altered their brains, lowering their inhibitions, causing hallucinations, and increasing aggression, although often these are just temporary. However, prolonged use of such chemicals can permanently alter the brain's functioning, leading to a reduction in its overall capability, the result of which can sometimes be a near-permanent zombie-like state. Perhaps even more frighteningly, in the last decade, Russia and the Ukraine has seen a startling rise in the use of a recreational drug that is sometimes referred to as the zombie drug. Known on the streets as crocodile, the drug is an illegally manufactured version of desomorphine, a variant of traditional morphine considered around 10 times more powerful. It is known as the zombie drug because as well as its powerful mental suppressive qualities, the toxicity of the substance, as a result of the poor standard it's manufactured, actually starts eating away the flesh where it's injected. In extreme cases, the flesh is rotted away to such an extent that it exposes the bone underneath. To the lay person, seeing someone stumbling through the streets, appearing barely conscious as they are high on the drug, and with flesh rotting away on their body, it would appear as though they are looking at a full-fledged zombie. 
About 1 million people in Russia use crocodile, according to a report by the New York State Office of Alcoholism and Substance Abuse Services. Since 2013, the crocodile drug has now spread across Europe, with confirmed use in Germany and Norway, while the first case made public in the UK occurred in 2019. In the US, the Drug Enforcement Agency has investigated claims of its use in Arizona and Illinois, but issued a statement saying that no evidence had been found, and despite sensationalist news stories. To the contrary, it seems that, that as of mid-2021, this remains the case. So we have seen that there are numerous examples of zombies being created out of living things in nature through illness, psychology, and the use of chemicals, but could people come back from the dead, as in most zombie movies? There have been incidents throughout history of people who have been considered dead and have reawoken later. Often these incidents can be attributed to poor medical knowledge resulting in an incorrect diagnosis, but even in recent history with modern technology, there seem to be incidents that defy logic. On Friday, June 1st, 2012, a two-year-old Brazilian boy named Calvin Santos was receiving treatment for pneumonia at a hospital in the Brazilian city of Belém. Calvin stopped breathing during his treatment, and at 7.40 p.m. his parents were told that he had been pronounced dead. His body was released for burial the next day, it being wrapped in an airtight plastic bag for transport. However, during the funeral, the family claimed that the boy suddenly woke up and asked for a glass of water. The family believed that a miracle had happened, but then around two hours later, the boy died again. When they felt it was clear he would never wake up a second time, they buried him. In July 2014, a three-year-old girl in the Philippines who had died in hospital a few days earlier was in her coffin when a neighbor noticed her head move. The family had then watched as she started breathing again before waking up. She was rushed back to the hospital where stunned doctors declared her fit and healthy before she was allowed to go home. It's difficult to investigate what happened in both these cases since they defy modern medicine, even when we consider the fact these incidents occurred in the third world. The available technology and experience of doctors in both cases suggested that they were dead, with neither child having a pulse or breathing. But this can possibly be true, can it? What are the possible explanations for these events? The two most obvious answers are firstly, the doctors were mistaken, and secondly, they are hoaxes. Doctors are not infallible, but it seems hard to believe that in both cases they missed evidence these children were still alive, since establishing a patient is alive is the most fundamental aspect of medicine. If they are hoaxes, then they are well-perpetrated ones, having convinced journalists and medical professionals alike. But is there evidence to suggest that a deceased person can actually come back from the dead? In 2016, doctors from Philadelphia-based Biocork Inc hope to trial a potential world-changing technique which aimed to grow neurons in a dead brain and force them to react with one another. The theory goes that eventually the brain would be restarted and it would then start instructing the body to function again. The doctors at Biocork, along with Revita Life Services, form the Reanima Project and believe they can achieve this by injecting stem cells into the spinal cords of people who have been declared clinically brain dead. The subject will then receive an injection protein blend and undergo electrical nerve stimulation and laser therapy, all directed at the brain in order to force it to react and potentially return it to life. It sounds far-fetched, but the group claims to have already had some limited success in their early trials with patients in Europe who were clinically brain dead, but their bodies still remaining viable. However, full trials that were planned to take place in India in 2016 were canceled because of bureaucratic reasons with the Indian government, and the project has since sought another country to carry out their experiments. In the face of the intense criticism in the United States especially, the project claimed in 2016 to have had permission from an undisclosed Latin American country to begin trials, but they also failed to materialize. Media reports in 2020 then stated that 20 so-called living cadaver patients had been selected from an African country to take part in the project. These were people who were effectively brain dead and being kept alive solely on machines. But in 2019, BioQuirk rebuffed the reports, but claimed that limited trials were being undertaken at hospitals in India. 
the project's leaders have said publicly that they firmly believe that these trials are the first stage to effectively reverse death. If that's true, could it be possible that the effect the project's effort will have on the human body could also be achieved naturally in some way, possibly with environmental factors at play? Could this offer an explanation for what happened in the case of Calvin and the girl in the Philippines? Until the Reanima project published their findings, we can't really say one way or another, since it's currently beyond medical science's definitions of life and death, and the tools with which it categorizes such definitions. Another possible explanation for these cases is that they enter a brief period of deep human hibernation that exists between a coma and final death. Humans have in the past shown a remarkable ability to lower body function and activity in order to survive. In 2006, Mitsutika Uchikoshi went missing on Mount Roku in Western Japan. As days turned to weeks, many of the search parties began to give up hope of finding him alive as the area was blanketed in snow and temperatures had dropped to freezing. Incredibly, however, he was found alive 24 days later, having survived by entering a state of nearly suspended animation. Doctors examining him found his organs had effectively shut down and his metabolism had slowed almost to a standstill. His body temperature had dropped to just 22 degrees Celsius when the normal temperature is 37 degrees. But despite all this, he made a full recovery. An even more incredible example of human hibernation is the story of Canadian toddler, Arika Nordby. In 2001, she wandered outside her home at the night in sub-zero conditions and was later found by her mother, almost frozen solid. In her case, doctors pronounced her clinically dead since her heart had stopped beating for two hours and her temperature had dropped to 16 degrees Celsius. Yet despite this, Arika's body restarted. And like Mitsutaka, she made a full recovery. If humans are capable of achieving such dead-like states of hibernation, then it's possible that Calvin Santos and the girl in the Philippines experienced a form of this human hibernation. The obvious difference is the claim in which these incidents in Japan and Canada took place but Santos was himself suffering from pneumonia when he was admitted to hospital, and it's possible this could have triggered the hibernation in some way. Again, unfortunately, we may never know. But in the wake of Arika Norby's case, the real question that needs to be asked is, should we redefine the parameters of what is dead and alive? Because as we saw with her, she was in medical terms dead. Since there are examples of zombie-inducing diseases and chemicals, then we have to ask ourselves whether a zombie apocalypse is actually a possibility. Even though we have now seen cases of the dead coming back to life, it's highly unlikely we would ever see a walking dead-like scenario ever happening. However, that is not to say that a zombie apocalypse is beyond a possibility entirely. The most likely cause for a zombie-like outbreak would be from a disease such as the human rabies virus. Currently in the state of Sarawak in Malaysia, there is an ongoing rabies outbreak that has claimed 33 lives between the initial outbreak in 2017 and mid-2021. The first victims were a six-year-old girl and her four-year-old brother, and within days, two more children were killed by it. A lack of information to the public regarding the seriousness of the situation was thought to be a major contributing factor in how quickly the disease spread, and the panic that followed. By 2021, the infection rate appeared to be slowing down due to an action on the part of local authorities and an increase in vaccination efforts. What concerns many medical experts, however, is that there seem to be cases where the vaccine for rabies does not work. In 2015, a six-year-old boy in Tunisia was given the rabies vaccine the same day he was bitten by an infected dog, and this should have been enough to prevent the disease from completing its incubation period. Unfortunately, two and a half weeks later, the boy began exhibiting strange behavior and when he was taken back to the doctors, they found he was still infected by rabies and died a short while later. A similar incident took place in Thailand in 2009 and again a year later in India. This failure rate is thankfully rare with figures released in Canada in 1997, putting it at just 47 out of 15 million treatments worldwide. There are two possible cases for the vaccine failing. Either it's rendered useless by poor storage practices or that the bite itself from an infected animal was not properly tended to. However, if the rabies virus were to mutate to such an extent that a vaccine might be rendered totally ineffective, then the result could be apocalyptic. 
One of the major aspects of a zombie apocalypse is the altered behaviour of those infected, and the consequences that would have for a society at large. While we have already looked at mind-altering chemicals affecting individuals, could there be a way of affecting huge numbers of people and bring about a chemically produced zombie apocalypse? While in the 1960s, Dr. Donald Johnson was serving as an MP in Britain, when he repeatedly expressed his fear that London's ability to function could be destroyed within eight hours as the population descended into a state of madness and anarchy. He was referring to his belief that London's weather supply could theoretically be contaminated with LSD and reflects the fear among the ruling middle and upper classes at the time of the growing problem of drug-induced crime. While it's possible on paper to contaminate a city's water supply in such a way, it is simply not practical. It would require a truly industrial effort to produce enough LSD to affect London's population. Firstly, the water would dilute any LSD added to it. Secondly, the purification process would break it down and even exposure to sunlight would destroy it. However, there are other ways to contaminate the population and cause the kind of results Dr. Johnson feared. In 2013, video game developer Naughty Dog released their critically acclaimed The Last of Us, set in a world that had suffered an outbreak of a human strain of the zombie fungus that affects ants in Thailand. While the type of fungal zombie outbreak in the video game is quite implausible, it is not beyond the realm of possibility that rampant fungal infections can affect the behaviour of a large population and there is a precedent for it. On August 15, 1951, the French town of Pont Saint-Esprit found itself in the grip of a seemingly uncontrollable and sudden madness. Over 250 people were affected by it, leading to mass hallucinations, self-inflicted injuries, paranoia and violence. In one case, an otherwise well-behaved 11-year-old boy tried to strangle his grandmother in a frenzied attack. In another case, a man believed he was an aeroplane and leapt out of a second floor window. While one man begged a doctor to help him find his heart, which he said had escaped his body. Seven deaths occurred while the town was in the grip of the madness. While 50 people were affected to such an extent, they were committed to psychiatric hospitals. The source of the outbreak was traced back to contaminated bread, but just what it was contaminated with has been debated ever since. Ergot poisoning from ingested alkaloids produced a type of fungus that affects rye and other cereals and has hallucinogenic properties has been largely accepted as the cause. However, in recent years, researchers have claimed that evidence has been uncovered that the CIA were involved in lacing the bread with LSD as part of a research effort into weaponizing the drug. In 2010, the author H.B. Alberelli Jr. published Terrible Mistake, the murder of Frank Olson and the CIA's secret Cold War experiments within which he claims to have seen an internal White House document highlighting an investigation into abuse by members of the CIA. One such document was a list of French nationals on the CIA's payroll and made references to the Pont Saint-Esprit incident. Regardless of who is to blame, the incident does prove that a population can have their behaviour affected en masse by an external source. However, there are more cerebral ways that a zombie apocalypse could occur. Earlier we looked at Dr. Watson's belief that anyone can be conditioned to behave a certain way, including like a zombie, if that was the desired result. But it's also possible for people to adopt certain behaviours, even psychological conditions, if they believe they are at risk of it. In 2012, 19 girls who attended Leroy High School started to develop tics and twitches associated with Tourette's. The outbreak baffled medical experts and led to speculation that a chemical spill that had occurred after a train derailed in the area in the 1970s was somehow to blame. Others believed the girls were victims of some new kind of recreational drug, but both theories were dismissed due to a lack of evidence in toxicology tests on the girls. Some neurologists, however, put forward the belief that a combination of stress and relative communal isolation caused the girls to experience a form of mass hysteria in essence, the girls believed they were vulnerable to developing the affliction, and as such they learned how to suffer from it. Social media, such as Facebook and YouTube, were even cited as having heavily contributed to the situation, with the girls uploading videos of themselves as they deteriorated, and this subconsciously instructed the next sufferer how they should behave at the next stage. If this is true, then it would not be beyond the realm of possibility that a small and isolated community could experience a zombie outbreak. If one person started behaving like one, and others believed enough 
that it could happen to them as well. This belief would be especially effective if it seemed to affect a specific type of person, such as gender and age, which were major factors in the Leroy case. Social media and news coverage would only further reinforce this belief and instruct people how to behave, even if they knew it was wrong or not normal. It sounds far-fetched, but ask yourself this. How many times have you seen someone yawn, and then involuntary yawn, even though you weren't feeling tired?